everybody, everybody. Oh, oh, oh my God. Ooh, wait, I got a guy on the channel today that y'all going to like what he got to say. Oh, man, let me tell you something. Uh, I'm Anthony Brogdon. Let me get that out the way. I'm Anthony Brogdon. Let me get that out the way because uh, this show is going to blow your mind. It, 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 let, me, uh, uh, let me see. Words don't describe it. But I'll tell you how it happened. I was to Selma for the bridge crossing. And they, it's a whole weekend of activities. It might start on Thursday and go through Sunday. And in event, this guy on the channel today was, I saw him a few times. And he, uh, he probably one of the few people who had a suit on. How about that? <laughs> he was nodding up. He was sharp. And, and you'll get some of the other dynamic. I'm not going to go into it, but you'll understand the dynamic of me watching him over everybody else. How about that? And so uh, I saw him a few times and I was like, wow. And, uh, and then one time I saw him as I uh, accidentally walked into the Black History Museum uh, on the Main Street in Selma. Uh, I just saw it and the door was open. There was a lady talking about, come on in. We got a little bit of time left. And he uh, was there. And so I said, to, I said, hey, man, who are you? And he told me the story. And here we are on Strong Inspirations where I give it to you straight, no chaser. I let the guests do the talking. I try to ask some intelligent questions so that y'all have been intoxicated with what they say not dui though but just intoxicated mind-blowing stuff and today's show is one of those it, 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 it it's it's a good show all of them are this one here is good too so hit the subscribe button no strong inspirations uh, i don't ask no information it's free to watch it this is my contribution to society how about that as I have uh, been fortunate and blessed to find the guests that come on here. Hit the like button. There is no love button. Hit the like button on this video. You're going to like it a lot. It's going to make you feel different. Hit the notifications bell for when the videos come up. You get a ding, a shock, a smoke signal. Your lights flicker. Your dog kicks you. Uh, 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 if something happens to let you know there's new content on Strong Inspirations. And we're coming out every week with something for Women's History Month on Sunday. Uh, every Sunday, it's March. Every Sunday at five o'clock, there's a new video, something related to women. Like, for example, there's a video on the women who have played a role in the civil rights in the New Jersey area. Little known facts. There's a video on the life of Shirley Chisholm. Y'all might have heard that name, but if you haven't, watch the video. There's a video on uh, what the trauma women have gone through in their lives. All this is on the show, and there's so much more. Uh, I'm going to lead into this guy in this regard. There's a video on the show y'all need to watch. It's a guy by the name of Chester Higgins. Chester Higgins is a white guy. And his he found out that his beloved, and him and, him, him and his grandfather, or great-grandfather was close, was in the KKK. And he killed the guy. And Chester said it, it just did not register well with him. And him and his father was strained relationship from that point on. And, uh, and, and because of his views, Chester's, uh, and, and, and uh, helping and educating uh, uh, Black people, he got jumped on one day. Oh, man. This thing goes full circle. And so uh, watch that video. Uh, now, a couple housekeepings. You know, I'm a filmmaker. This is a documentary that I've done titled Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. Watch this. It's on Amazon. It's good. It's an hour and 15 minutes long. From that, I wrote this book. It's titled Black Business Book. It's uh, similar to the documentary, 
but has more facts. That this book is good. I, 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 it has been called America's number one black business history book. Well worth your reading. Get you a copy of this. Uh, one more, because uh, I'm thorough. I got a children's book out now. It's titled, They Did It. It's 30 rich African-Americans, black folks who lived in the 1800s for children to understand and know these stories. I tell you, I got a picture of them. I tell you their name, the year they were born, and what they did. All that is in my website. Uh, and go to the website. Kind of follow it because I post things on there. And some of the trips. I just came back, like I said, from Selma. And uh, one of the other ones I got is I want to be in Galveston for Juneteenth. Uh, and that's, uh, I'll post that. And when I, when I say I'm going, come along with me. Uh, you may, you know, I'll help with some arrangements if necessary, but come along with me and let's see this thing together. Now you hear me use this term strong a lot. Strong is my favorite word. And in my world, strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to the guest today. He's a strong man, good looking guy too. Sharp, every time I saw him, he was sharp. And, 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 and y'all gonna like this. So come on, introduce yourself. Let's get it on. Thank you for, for being on Strong Inspirations. Yes, sir. I, I, I appreciate uh, you reaching out to me. I enjoyed our conversation when we first met. Uh, my name is Charles Sims. I'm the founder of the Dream 2020 Group, uh, an Iraq War veteran and Ole Miss alumni. Um, where we first met at the museum, um, that was one of my original ideas uh, was to reach out to the museums to try to um, talk to them because I thought it was important um, for me to come there. And I thought it was important to be documented and, 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 you know, remember not, not for my purposes, but for, for, for other purposes, you know? Um, okay. Let me stop you there. I mean, no disrespect, sure. but let me let my guests get to know you a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, where were you born and raised? So I was born in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, my mother and father were both in law school at Ole Miss when, when, when they had me. And obviously I grew up a son of the South and was raised in that culture. And it definitely had a big impact on me. All right. Where is Oxford? Where is that? Oxford, Mississippi is approximately about an hour south of Memphis. Okay. Uh, a, a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Were you born Absolutely. in the white neighborhood? Um. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, where Where did the black people live? Um. In Oxford, I mean, it's a it's primarily a university town. Um. Granted, there are certain areas where there's more whites and less blacks, but or more whites or less blacks and less blacks and more whites. But, you know, it's a university town. So I think there was it's all it, it, Mrs. Oxford, Mississippi is dramatically different than the rest of Mississippi. It's kind of an outlier because of that kind of university status. It, it, it you know, it may have been plagued by some of the issues of the past, but it, it definitely it it's kind of an outlier different than many other places. Um, the coast of Mississippi is also uh, dramatically different than the, 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 the deep South or the Delta areas. But, uh, but yeah, all oh, Oxford, I, I was born there in 1982. Um, but yeah, I, I, I lived there for a few years, obviously when I was an infant and my mother and father were finishing school, but I didn't have much history of it, you know, or recollection okay. of it. I do now, I do now cause I visit often, but um yeah, I love going to football games and everything else, hotty toddy. Okay. But uh, but yeah, okay. obviously there was different sections of town back then. But okay. Oxford's kind of a more liberal place than the majority of Mississippi, if that makes okay. sense. You, you said you you uh, did, but you uh, y'all moved from there someplace else. Yeah, so uh, early on, my mother and father divorced uh, when I was approximately three years old, and my mom, my mom moved to Ocean Springs, Mississippi, and my dad lived in Memphis. So I grew up on the coast of Mississippi, which was much more of a melting pot of uh, different communities, black, white, Vietnamese, you know, just many different cultures down there. So like many coastal areas, it was much more of a melting pot. Um, so I think that growing up, on the coast um definitely had a 
impact on me opposed to if I was to have grown up in the historical areas where my family is from, the Greenwood, okay. Greenville, Indianola areas, you know, the Delta areas. Okay. Uh, but, you, you say but, the coast, you were close to the water or something like yes, that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was close to the coast um, until before my, let me back up just a, a tad bit. Before my father moved back to Memphis, um, he lived in Sumner, Mississippi, which is right on the banks of the Tallahatchie River. And that also had a, a big impact on my upbringing because his house was about 200 yards away from where the trial was done for the murders of Emmett Till. So I grew up in that reality, hearing the stories about Emmett Till, um, learning about the the story and the, the, the murder and everything else. So yeah, it, growing up in Tallahatchie County, you know, just right down the road from where uh, Emmett Till was killed had a big impact on me. All right. Uh, we're going to stay on this. Um, sure. but, but did you play with black kids? Um, and on the coast? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and Sumner, Mississippi, that wasn't, that wasn't frequent. Um, where I grew up on the coast, like I said, it was much more of that melting pot. So, you know, we, we didn't look at race growing up down there. Like we just, we were kids who played with everybody, you know, um, but in Sumner, Mississippi, yeah, the old times were still pretty present. And, and you know, the the black community stayed on one side, the white community stayed on the other side. And and, and that was that was pretty still pretty prevalent in the 80s. Uh, OK, you know, one of the things that they say uh, is that uh, racism is a learned behavior. And, and that's understandable. Sure. How, how do people learn it? Do they sit at the table at dinner time and say, OK, these are the things don't do? These are the ways we act, uh, uh, or it's just on an everyday occurrence. They say some things, and you pick, and a person can pick up on. Yeah, I think that um, as far as my background, no, it wasn't talked about at the dinner table. Um, maybe slight comments in passing. Um, like, you know, you maybe need to do this or not talk about this in these situations. But um, but my mother, I grew up with my mother, so she had a very big impact on me. And she was um, a very kind and caring person, very loving person. And that was who I grew up with. So she played a very big impact on me. And if anyone outside of God has credit in, in any thing that I've done. It would be my mother, Catherine. Yeah. And she was a very loving person and always taught me to, um, you know, treat other people like you would want to be treated and to, and to look mm -hmm. past uh, skin color and everything else. So she, she, she had a massive impact on my life and uh, you know, we can get into it later, but she yeah. was one of the primary motivators to me going to Selma, Alabama. I told her about me going uh, back last October and she passed in November. And, and, and oh, so man. I wanted to follow through with, you know, my word to her and, and, okay. and, and travel to Selma. All right. Well, let me ask you this. But when you went over a friend's house who didn't have yeah. the same uh, high morals, did, did, did their dad say something or you heard him talk to the kids? Yeah, yeah. Like you, you would hear stuff in passing. You would, you would hear, you would hear the the racial slur stuff like that. I mean, and you know, in 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 the Delta or in Sumner, Mississippi, back in the eighties. Yeah, I mean, you, you you just knew how it was. I mean. People didn't intermingle. Like we, when we would go to the country club there, the only the only black people that I saw were dressed in black and white waiters. And they're, they're, it, it, and now Morgan Freeman plays golf there. You know what I'm saying? So obviously it's came quite a long way. Um, but yeah, I don't remember uh, children interacting at that country club, at that swimming pool, when, even in the 80s. I mean, obviously it's long after Jim Crow and segregation and everything else. But um, but yeah, I, I did not. I, I think it was more of a, a an underhanded approach opposed to people being out front and direct with, with how things were, you know, I don't, I don't think it was like a, this is that way, this is this way. Um, but you just didn't kind of intermingle, you know, I, it, I, I think there were small comments here and there, but um, I don't think that was ever, ever present. You know, I don't think yeah, it was okay. like that. Well, did, did you ever uh, occur where uh, one of your buddies uh, mm -hmm. said things yeah, absolutely. 
yeah, I, I mean, I grew up in this reality. It, it wasn't like um, I had this. <laughs> I, I didn't grow up a racist or uh, was taught all this stuff. I didn't have like a coming to Jesus moment, but yes, absolutely. It was, it was prevalent throughout my life and would hear, you know, that stuff normally it was, it was a common thing back then. Um, Give me an example of uh, one that, you know, uh, um, in, in grade school or high school or something. Sure, you know, sure, sure. Right so, here. so I grew up on the coast, like I said, in that melting pot. So that wasn't as prevalent down there. I'm talking yeah. about my very early childhood, All where right. you would you would hear old stories about Emmett Till and and that that thing about just like a um and racial be blunt, be blunt on yeah. this show too. Yeah, well, they, they you know, y'all would hear stories uh, passed down that uh, where they would say, you know, it's just like an word trying to swim across the river with a fan on his back, and those things were 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 questions as a as a child that I didn't even understand what that meant back then. You know what I'm saying? And I I'm so young trying to understand like what are you talking about? What why this kid die in the river and everything else? But um, but yeah, I, it wasn't something that was ever present because it was separate so it it wasn't like uh it was a constant thing they just excluded people and 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 one person stayed on one side one person stayed on the other side so it wasn't one of those things that was ever present i wasn't uh raised a racist or anything like that i didn't have this come to jesus moment where i changed yeah, I everything in my life and had this massive impact but what, what what i will tell you is if uh if any of your, your of your viewers have seen the movie that uh the movie the help my great grandfather's home is highlighted in that film where Mimi cooked the pies. That was my great grandfather's home. So when I would go to Thanksgiving dinner in Carrollton, Mississippi, um, where we, we, where we would eat often, um, as soon as I walked in the door, there was a gigantic portrait of Robert E. Lee. So it's not like I didn't know where I came from or, um, you know, didn't know my background, so to speak. I didn't understand the entire impact of that background or, 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 uh, uh, of my great great grandfather's uh, authoring of the Constitution, and and my mom just talked about it in a passing, like yeah, our relative wrote this document, and and didn't kind of go into detail about the uh, the impact or the negative impact that it had on the uh, freedom and voting rights of Black Americans. It wasn't uh, until much later where I kind of did a deep dive into reading and history i've always been uh, very interested in history and that kind of opened my eyes to wow this wasn't just some document this was this had a massive impact okay, we're but gonna go, we're gonna go into that what, sure. what let's go back a little a couple generations uh, sure. if i may ask this do you was one of your great grandfathers an enslaver absolutely yes he had a plantation absolutely he was a confederate was, general was he wealthy did he have a big plantation Yes, he was. He was. He was a, a senator after the war. He was a chief justice of Mississippi Supreme Court before the war. He owned a plantation and, um, yeah, fought to, to fought to defend that institution and and, and his property. What well, uh, what what did he grow? Was he a farmer? Uh, or? Yeah, yeah, he was a farmer. Yeah, cotton. It was cotton. Yes, sir. Uh, because it's, 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 it's cotton was a, a very lucrative crop. Is that correct? Absolutely. And 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 uh, how did he do business? I never heard this side of the story. Do you know anything about that? How did uh, I, I don't know about the business side of it? I would have to defer yeah, to yeah, uh, yeah. his his the author of his biography as far as that's concerned. I haven't read yeah. deep into his papers as far as yeah, what. Yeah, the, yeah. So so he he was a farmer, but. He was a much more. Uh, he was a very successful lawyer. He had one of the most successful law firms in uh, in Mississippi during that time. So he was, you know, a soldier, a farmer, a, a legal scholar. But yeah, his his the majority of his um, efforts revolved around the legal uh, profession. So they had they the Congress in Mississippi had to pass a special. Um, um, thing for him to become a lawyer because he came a, became a lawyer at like the age of like 19 or 20 years old. So he was extremely advanced. Um, Did he education. go to law um, I don't, not that I'm aware of, not, not, okay. I know okay. he went to the, 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 you know, the field schools back in the day, but as far as his, his, 
um, legal training. I'm not exactly sure about that. I I, I don't know okay. if he went to an official university, but I know yeah. he became a lawyer before he was, you know, 21 years old. All so right. He, Let's he, stay he on that just to, just a tad sure. more. What what kind sure. of law did he practice? That's a good question. I'm not, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm a, I assume back then uh, there was many different things as far as the land disputes, uh, property disputes, trust, wills. You know, I assume that he 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 probably dealt with a lot of stuff. Could he been a prosecutor? Um, not that I'm aware of. So, um, so it wasn't like he was in working for the government to prosecute black. I guess what I'm getting no. at. Yeah, no, not not that I'm aware of. So, yeah. so one thing that one thing that was uh, that pops up where he was very influential in the beginning was he became a uh, uh, a reporter for the Mississippi Supreme Court, and he began working on um, volumes um, for the court, and um, and so after some of that initial stuff, he 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 became a supreme court justice um but that was for a short time before he entered the senate and stuff like that but i think that's where he more began his legal career was working for the mississippi supreme court um after he was a lawyer so once he once he began uh as a lawyer shortly thereafter the mexican american war kicked off and he uh he and he he joined the uh, mississippi volunteer rifle regiment uh commanded by the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. So he fought in two wars for Jefferson Davis. He was a private under uh, Jefferson Davis in the Mexican-American War and a general under uh, Jefferson Davis in the American Civil War. So he followed uh, Jefferson Davis to Monterey, Mexico and fought in the Mexican-American War. And and then after coming back, you know, he was a lawyer shortly and then went to the war and then came back and then started doing some of that court reporting for the Supreme Court and then the lead up to the American Civil War. Sure. Was he a racist? Um, I think that anybody that was defending that type of stuff back then had some type of racial component to them. I think that a lot of people during that time were, um, let's say, products of the time. That's what I'm. That's what. I, that's what I'm getting at. Because sometimes he, he might not be. See, some some right. enslavers were worse than others. Absolutely. I Absolutely. Would think. Some might. Yes. You know, if you did something, I beat you. I kill you. I'd whatever. Some sure. might not have been that way. Sure. So I so when I first began this, I I I, I know the uh, author of the uh, biography that wrote his book. He were, he's a professor at UT Martin. So I reached out to him and kind of picked his brain. Obviously, I read multiple books and multiple writings and everything else. To, that was one of the things that I tried to figure out. What was his humanity? Uh, what was what 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 in the whitewash part of it? But what was the real uh, humanity in him? And one of his best friends, um, if you could call it a friend, was one of his former slaves. Um, uh, after he was freed, he uh, he stayed he stayed you know in the area and and stayed on the plantation uh, for the majority of his life afterwards. And um, one thing that that, that kind of spoke to me it was upon George's death, um, hundreds. That, of his that's former, his name, George. Uh, Senator George was Senator was who George. I, okay. Yeah, okay. but his friend, I would have to look up to see what his what yeah, his yeah, friend's yeah, name yeah, was. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it, it passes my mind. I can't remember yeah, right yeah, now. But yeah. um, but he he was very friendly with them, and 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 that that he, it was his body servant. And during the Civil War, that body servant actually stayed with his family and and helped uh, bury his 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 precious items in the in the yard and go back and retrieve them and stayed with his family throughout the war and helped them out and like i said after that he was emancipated he, he you know he stayed around but one thing that i saw um that also spoke to me was upon george's funeral hundreds of uh his his former slaves attended his funeral and um oh, a lot really? of the town a lot yeah a lot of the town's people and 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 um and edmund pettus was also at that funeral um so that's part of the connection to me and talking about the, Sel the Edmund Pettus Bridge um, and, and traveling to Selma because uh, Senator George and uh, Edmund Pettus were colleagues in life. But that was one thing that I tried to figure out early on was what was uh, Senator George's humanity 
is this a worthwhile venture? Because if I thought he was the type of person that, um, like you were speaking of previously, like a, just a brutal person, then I then I wouldn't I wouldn't I would not have stand and stood on this, and and and, and I wouldn't have tried to uh, redeem certain things as far as his name was concerned. But I did feel that I saw a certain humanity in him. Not only that, I think he would have been in favor of what I'm doing. And I know that's hard. I know, I know that, I know that's hard to understand. Um, but I feel like there were small breadcrumbs along the way that led me to understand this. And I do feel that he would have been in favor of me speaking out, um, speaking out against the, um, the, the hatred and bitterness of the past to bring about unity in the community. All I right. feel that um, he was a product of his time and he did what he did to protect his section. And it was up to other people to protect it, hit theirs in protecting his. I, hold on. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? His section. So his, 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 his the white society. So during that time, um, obviously there was a lot of, um, let's call it election violence, so to speak. Um, during that time, uh, after the South was occupied, there was a lot of tumultuous years. Um, unfortunately, we the white community was trying to figure out how to rebuild after the war. And, and a lot of what they had to do to figure that out was unfortunately was to try to figure out how to take away the black vote. And they thought that that was the best way forward for them. Unfortunately, other people thought, well, let's hold, uh, you know, hold a, a election violence at the polls or something like that. Um, George was in favor of, 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 of trying to stop election violence between blacks and whites. And so that was one of the first things that interested me in one of the stories that I, that I figured. That okay. I, let that me I stop found. you there. Let me stop you there. Sure. Cause you on the road. Can I figure, can so, I finish this one? Can I finish yeah, this ahead, one? Go ahead, yeah, yeah, go okay. Ahead, go ahead, yeah, so yeah. he had, he had a meeting with a, a governor, uh, uh, Delbert Ames, one of the carpetbagger governors sent by the North. So back in 1875, there was a lot of election violence and he went and sat down with uh, governor Delbert Ames and tried to quell election violence. So I thought to myself, Anthony, if he can go sit down with this governor and try to uh, men, certain relations. We're not going to, he, he probably understood. We're not going to make everything perfect, but if he could have contacted that governor then and said, you know, this is unacceptable. The violence that is going on is unacceptable. We need to try to sit down across party and racial lines in search of that conflict resolution. I said, wow, if he was doing that back then, can I do that now? now I got you. I love it. Let me ask yes, you this. Sir. So what happened was, so he's got this plantation. Was he married? Yes, sir. They had kids and stuff like yeah, that. He probably had, he, he had a, a load of kids, 10, 11 yeah, kids. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you this then. Did he have any kids with any of the enslaved? So there are rumors about that. Um, I I think there are some people that claim descendancy to him. I haven't met, I, I don't know of DNA evidence that I don't oh, think it's okay. ever been, I don't think anything's ever been confirmed as far as um, did George have uh uh, children out of wedlock there are some um um there are some rumors to that effect um somebody that okay. uh, said that one of my cousins uh talked with him not too long ago uh, uh one of the people that was claiming descendancy of that and they did do a dna test which came back negative but um neither here nor there but it, it could uh, have happened yes sir i mean uh, there, there there are rumors about it there are some uh people in that area that still use that last name so sims is the last name no, sims no sir george the uh, senator george yeah there are still people so george had a lot of a lot of girls so most of the the george name died off and and the majority of the girls married but um um there was only one or two uh or two or three males one of them uh infant males died died during childbirth and uh uh, another one died or, or earlier in life but um but yeah th there were some reports or rumors as far as did george have children out of wedlock and right. it's possible i don't know of any con confirmed uh evidence right. of that but there okay. are some there are some uh people in the Carrollton area some black people that do use the last name george that say they are descendants of george but i can't i can't i mean I, okay. I don't know i don't know specifically so, so what happened was there was enslavement 
the North Troop comes through. Mm -hmm. When do they come through that time? Do they come through in 1862, three, four, five? Do you know that? So in, 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 in that, in that it, so in that area, uh, Grant's army was coming into Vicksburg. Uh, Georgia's home was, you know, north central of Vicksburg, and they were coming down from Memphis as well. So there was multiple incursions from the north and the south area. Um, but yeah, I would say they they retreated from that area. I'd say in 1863 1864 and then came back but um but yeah by 1864 i think they were long out of that area so george uh, to 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 kind of tell you about the situation george was captured twice in combat and uh spent two and a half years in a northern prison camp so he, he you know <laughs> the kind of a running joke was he wasn't the best soldier he was called a lot but uh but his family obviously was in that area and moving around that area during that time but uh but yeah george was was captured twice in combat the second time uh in the second battle of Collierville up by memphis tennessee and he was he was captured and then then paroled after the war but uh but yeah he spent two and a half years in a northern prison camp and <laughs> and, and and that's the part that's that's part of the people the, the some of the the warnings that I try to tell people through history is that a lot of people you know when say for instance was when Texas was try, talking about securing the border a couple of weeks ago and civil war was trending on online and people were talking about Governor Abbott and Biden and you know conflict and this and that and that's what I try to tell people like you don't have any idea what you're what you're talking about once you go down that path so three members of my family. Um, uh, fought directly in that area. Two of them signed the ordinance of secession. And of those three people, George was captured twice, spent two and a half years in a prison camp. One was killed at the Battle of Shiloh, and the other was uh, wounded at the Battle of Mills Creek and disabled and died at a very young age. So every member of my family that fought in that area was either killed, captured, or, 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 um, or, or or killed, you know, and okay. and okay. killed, ca you, killed no, captured, I, or so went to prison. So that it, my my, yeah. my family suffered greatly, and right. and and that's why I tell people is like you have to understand the 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 implications of going down the wrong path, but also in action. And so when, when, once you start going down that path of civil conflict, you had better understand that your family could suffer greatly for it. Okay, but they were killed fighting for the institution of slavery. Sure, because they were fighting for the South. Mm. Um, let me ask you this. So what happens is, uh, did, did any of, there were people who did not enlist because maybe they didn't like the institution or they didn't want to leave their farm, so on and so forth. So if you did enlist, you, you felt some sense of allegiance. I mean, I can't speak to that because I yeah, wasn't yeah, there, yeah. but, yeah, but yeah, I was, yeah. a I was a soldier myself. And I know that if you feel strongly about something and you're willing to die for it, yeah, I mean, you, if you, if you feel that strongly, you had better be willing to uh, uh, believe in what you're fighting for. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. That's a good point. Let me ask you this. So then what happens is the truth come through, they free the land, the, uh, George, Senator George, other people leave. And mm. then that's the reconstruction period. Yes, sir. Did, did did blacks it uh operate on his property during that time? Um yes sir. Yeah. Yeah, several then what several, happened? several several people stayed behind and became, you know, became workers after the after the after the, some of the same people that stayed on the farm uh or that that were enslaved on the farm did stay afterwards and 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 continue to work the land. But they didn't work it under his direction. They worked it for themselves. Because he uh, flees. No, after the war, he came back to his, his home. How soon after the war? Because, I mean, is it like the war ends and then they come right back? You, you follow what I'm asking? I just was yeah, wondering, sure, sure, is sure. there yeah, a time no, period I mean, where they left I mean, and I, come I, back? I, I would say a very short period thereafter, you know, as far as crops go. I mean, you don't have much time to, to sit idly by. You know, stuff's got to be moved in, in and out of the field pretty quickly. But, yeah, I mean, George was paroled. And, yeah, I would say things were back to, uh, as far as planning goes, I would say things were back to normal within the year, you know. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So what happens even after the war ended, it did not stop the institution of enslavement per se. Mm, no, because at that point you had 
voting rights. You could walk right off anywhere you wanted to. There was no, there was nothing holding you to that area as far as having the monetary ability to flee to the north or something like that. But no, I mean, after the war, that 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 was a very unique period where the yeah. the, the former enslaved kind of stood in the sunlight for a very brief period and and had and had a lot. They may they may have not had a lot of money, but the uh, you know there was Union troops in the area that occupied the South. They they you know had received some of the first um, um, African American uh, congressmen and senators and yeah, people in right, government. Right. So I mean okay, they, okay. they they. they but shortly thereafter, that came to a screeching halt within, I would estimate, uh, 10 years, 10 years, eight to 10 years. And, and the the politics of that area were already plotting on figuring a way to, 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 to you know, um, um, to take away certain rights and voting right. rights uh, 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 because they understood how powerful the, the, the right to vote was. And so um, right. um, there was but a lot of elections. My- what, what I'm getting at is, okay, he flees, and mm-hmm. you think a year later he comes back and he's the owner of the house again, and now these people are working for him, and maybe he has to pay them something. Yeah, yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, at that point, if you were a sharecropper or what, whatever you want to call it, but yeah, I mean, they that at that point they they had to figure out. George had to figure out an option to bring in labor, or the fields weren't getting worked. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, somebody. Ah. Had to Right. Had to be had to be, had to be right. paid at that point. Had to be right. paid. I got you. I I didn't know that. I, I didn't know how long that period was. Um. So uh, does he? Uh, 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 just on him. How does his life end? Um. As far as how he passed. Yeah. 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 In in his later years after the war. So he he, he, pa- like he passed a, a natural causes. Um. He started having some ailments uh, around like. A, the, I'd say the summer, let's say the winter of 1897. And I think that kind of progressed his, his um, wife passed not long before he passed. Um, I think he lived maybe another, don't quote me on this, but I would say another eight to 12 months. But I think that kind of started him down that path where he was ailing at the same time she was ailing. She went first. And then, you know, he went there shortly thereafter. They, he was, he was, he had fallen on kind of ill health and they thought that he would, they would move him down to Mississippi city down on the coast. Um, and that was a popular area to convalescence because that was where Jefferson Davis's home Beauvoir was. And it was created into a, a convalescence area for uh, former veterans. So I think that, you know, the, 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 sea air i think they 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 had went to bring him down there to see if the 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 fresh air would kind of revive him but i think the the trip down there probably did more to did more to hurt him than not but yeah he died shortly after there after they brought him down there in 1897 around august of 1897 and then you know they brought his body back up from the coast through jackson he was laid laid and stayed at the capital and then they brought him back to his hometown uh what what happened to the plantation house is it still uh, in the family and that kind of thing yes sir yeah my family still lived in it up until about i'd say about 13 14 years ago shortly oh, really? before the, yeah that they're still on the property they still work the property um they have more cows out there now instead of cotton or soybean or anything like that but um they uh lived in the house up until uh like i said about 12 14 years ago the help movie came to into town they did the movie the help you know at that house and several other places and um then i think it was uh there was a a deal done with the state to make it like a historical cultural foundation uh oh, cultural really? site so oh, they're, they're okay. they, they hold some events at it where they do some where they do some um you know, events, gatherings, weddings, oh, and you know stuff like that. But it's it, I, it's now a, a state, I believe, a state historical stuff site. And is it one of those houses with those big white pillars in the front? No, all, yeah. all that. How, how many yeah. acres did he have? You know, a lot, a lot, hundreds, thousands. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. How many enslaved people did he uh, have? Do you know? Is that record? I don't that? know. I don't know the exact number, but it was it was large. It was it was probably one of the uh, he probably had 
He was probably one of the leaders in the state. Let's put it at that like oh, that. Oh, really? Okay. For sure. Now you said he uh he ran around with Edmund Pettis. Yeah, so him and him and Edmund Pettis do have a history. Well, who is Edmund Pettis? What was his so what's his story? Do you know? Uh so Edmund Pettis, um early on in the lead up to the Civil War was sent by the state of Alabama to the review the secession convention in Mississippi in 1860. His brother, John Pettus, was the then governor of Mississippi. So obviously my great grandfather was working directly with John Pettus, the governor. His brother, Edmund Pettus, was sent by Alabama to review the secession convention of what of which my great grandfather, two of my great grandfathers were uh members of that body. So two members of my family signed the ordinance of secession from Mississippi and Edmund Pettus was at that uh, convention. So they would have all been present talking about the uh, proceedings to leave the union. Uh, and so it was a, it was a, a, a concerted effort to leave the union at that time. They're saying, Hey, the people of North don't want it. We want it. This is our solution. Mm is to leave the union. So they're having these meetings and Edmund and Pettus, he was in this slavery also? Um, I would assume so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, among, among, among other things, I, I think he had some history in the Klan after the war as well. Oh, um, really? But yeah, as far as Edmund Pettus, I don't know. I I mean, that's for other people to speak on as far as his yeah. relationship to, to the war and slavery and whatnot. But I don't I don't know I, his history with slavery or anything else. But yeah, I do know yeah. that he obviously fought for the South and was a soldier of the Confederate Army. Yeah. Did, were there uh, uh, are there remnants of like some of your grandfather's uh, uh, Senator George? Do y'all have his? Is a union uniform and rifle. And I don't. I, I mean, any of those I, things. I, I don't know of any artifacts as far as that. I mean, he was obviously captured in combat, so anything he would have had on him would have been confiscated. Uh, are there things in the house? As far as yeah, there's 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 furniture and yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's uh, there's well, I, I, as far as Confederate. Uh, oh no, no. I mean, there's there's no there's no Confederate artifacts as far as that's concerned. Mm. Uh, so now, okay, so now, what's the other part of the story? Uh, and you alluded to it just a second. They mm. signed your, your somebody in your family did the writing of the Jim Crow laws. You you mentioned to me. Is that sure. is that what you said? And let's tell let's talk about that. Sure. Um, So, yeah, um, George, after the war, um, after the war, he became a, a United States senator. And like I like we previously talked about, there was a lot of election violence and um, because the whites were trying to suppress the black vote. And George had the idea that we don't have to have election violence and stop people through direct violence at the polls, we can put this into legislation. And a lot of his Democratic colleagues actually did not want him to do that. Um, they were not in favor of that because they thought that if they passed discriminatory laws, that they would be reoccupied by the northern uh, northern troops again. And that was one thing that they did not want was the interference from the north after they had uh, gotten rid of uh, those last vestiges of, 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 of the, 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 you know, the northern occupation, so to speak. Um, but, yeah, in 1890, they had a, a convention where they rewrote the Mississippi Constitution. You know, after, after the war, there was a constitution written, you know, that was more favorable to, you know, everybody. Um, but they had an idea that, you know, we could put it into law to suppress the black vote. It wasn't going to be called to suppress the black vote. But so George was the driving force behind the poll, poll taxes, literacy test, and the understanding clause. So that was the the evil evil genius behind the Jim Crow laws was those three things: the poll taxes, the literacy tests, and the understanding clause. Because if you could, if they showed you a document and said, "Read this," and can you understand it and, and interpret it? If you can't, you can't vote. 
but their argument was is that well this isn't just for black folks this is for illiterate white folks as well but who's going to be the person interpreting who can understand this and who can't so it, it left a lot open to interpretation but george um and I, I don't think a lot of people know the history about this and this is part of the reason why i set out to educate people about this because george studied the constitutions of 15 northern states in preparation for this and he said that in maryland you discriminate because of this in pennsylvania you discriminate against your citizens for this you discriminate the vote in new york because of this so how are you going to tell us in mississippi that we can't discriminate how we would like to so he used the united states laws against itself and they said when he defended the mississippi constitution before the senate when he finished there was not a single reply and that says something to me that he had outsmarted the entire united states senate where not even one person with the biggest discrimination act in American history, not one person even gave reply. If that's not amazing, I don't know what it is. And it's amazing for the fact that no one was willing to stand up for the voting rights of black Americans. That's the, well, that's the, that's the wildest part to me, that George had outmaneuvered the entire Senate to you know, in, in, in place the laws that he thought were important to, you know, secure the white vote for Mississippi. All right. Uh, let me just say this. What happened was once the Civil War, and I'm going, I keep going back on this. Once the Civil War happened, then there was that Reconstruction period that they allowed mm -hmm. Black men to vote. Absolutely. And so Black men voting, and we're voting in blocks, and now we have all these Black politicians Mm -hmm. what, do you know of who were some of the they were like a were they a black senator governor uh uh they, they what occupied, happened in they mississippi occupied, yes they occupied many positions they occupied many positions and 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 not only that they had black militias as well and so they had they had ways to defend themselves and and yeah having some of the first black senators or first black congressmen you know calling the shots and making the rules i, I don't think i mean obviously all most right. of mississippi were probably not okay with that all right did, did other states so, so let me let let, let, let me back ahead, up real quick within within 10 years of the end of the civil war to when my great-grandfather had become the chief justice of the Mississippi Supreme Court, every, sim every single member on that court were Confederate war veterans. Not only that, J.A.P. Campbell, Josiah Abigail Patterson Campbell, and my great-grandfather, Senator George, were seated back-to-back -back on the Mississippi Supreme Court. You know who the great-grandfather, you know who the great-great-grandson of J.A.P. Campbell is? No. James Meredith, the man that integrated Old Miss. So the two times great grandfather of James Meredith, the person that integrated Ole Miss and started the march against fear, and my great grandfather were seated, seated back to back on the Mississippi Supreme Court together. Not only that, J. A. P. Campbell was a pallbearer for Senator George. All right, I, 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 for me, I, uh, what I what I'm getting at, a black man was on the Mississippi Supreme Court. No, sir, that was his white relative. Oh. Oh, okay. I'm glad I asked that question because I yep. thought that's what you were saying. So back to what we were so back to what we back to what we were talking about right, earlier. Right, 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 J. Right. P. Campbell did have children with with uh, with he did have black family members and right, and James right. Meredith. Me and him had a conversation. This was extremely interesting to me. Is that James Meredith said that J. P. Campbell passed down to his descendants on how to dismantle white supremacy, and that was what led eventually to James Meredith integrating Ole Miss. Just truly amazing. I mean, the history is just, yeah, amazing. Okay, so now they have all these Black people, and then they say, okay, now we're going to put in these laws so they can't vote, and all the Black senators and congressmen, they go away. So it didn't have, it didn't, it didn't say because you were Black, you can't vote. Then didn't, didn't, it, it didn't just, say It that. just, those tests that they made them do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um... So they went yeah, from other in states. Does go ahead. You you saying so something. in Mississippi prior to those laws, there was over a hundred thousand qualified black voters. After those laws, less than twelve thousand. 
less than 12,000. So they basically figured out a way to take away that voting block and, 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 you know, yeah, okay. Okay. force them out because the black, the blacks were outnumbering the whites in Mississippi. So regardless right. of what they did, they were all, the whites were always going to lose the polls, you know? Right. 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 What, what, uh, uh, let, let's go back to this, uh, if you know. What was some of the violence that they were doing to Blacks so that they would be afraid to go vote, even when they had to vote? Um, I, I mean, obviously, you can look back through history. I don't know what the, the exact examples were, but, you know, the... the uh, I, I don't know what tactics yeah, yeah. they use. Obviously, we you can read about the Ku Klux Klan and everything else to see what what um, what things what what techniques were used. But I, I don't know what they specifically did at the polls right, to stop right. people from coming. You know, right? Um, did other states adopt his same uh, po uh, constitutional? Yes. Yes. So the, so so that was the blueprint that all the other southern states followed. That was uh, Mississippi was the first to do it. So all the other southern states used his similar blueprint. So that's why they call him the 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 grandfather of white supremacy, because he was the person that that came up with all these things. And like I said, his Democratic colleagues were not in favor of him doing that. So he was he was definitely a. a person that kind of went by his own own step he, he thought that this was the way to suppress the black vote not through violence and um and and yeah the yeah louisiana alabama south carolina they adopted very similar uh codes um does this put him uh he gets awards for this and that you know what i mean and 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 honors and so on and so forth for 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 writing this, I don't I don't I don't I don't understand your question. Uh, because he did such a good job on the Constitution, is he now considered the man of the hour? <laughs> you know what I mean? And and newspapers are, are, are acknowledging uh, yeah, him absolutely, for his work. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay. He, re, he I don't know about honors, but he, he redeemed Mississippi for white. For he redeemed what 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 they said he 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 redeemed they they looked at it as a redemption of Mississippi because you know the 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 blacks had basically taken over everything that the whites used to control in Mississippi so he was the person that was able to flip the script on that and and bring power back to the whites so yeah I, I mean as far as was he acclaimed during that time I, yeah i mean he was obviously a influential person what awards he received i have no idea yeah, yeah, but yeah. uh but i do know one thing that his statue sits in the united states capitol building along with jefferson davis's so as far as uh what people considered his impact. Oh you know, man, really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they definitely looked at it in the light where they thought it was important enough to send his statue to the Capitol building. Um. So, uh, what what's your take on them? Uh, since you brought that up, uh, tearing down Confederate uh, statues. Sure. Um. So, not only did my Three times great grandfather, Senator George, author of the 1890 Constitution of Mississippi, created the Jim Crow laws. One of his daughters, my great great aunt, was the national president of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So not only did we create the laws, we also built the statues. That's what th that's what that organization did. The United Daughters of the Confederacy, Confederacy were the guiding uh, influences behind creating many of the, the Confederate monuments. What's your take so, on taking them down? Um, I think that everything has a story to tell. I think that... Um, History is important. I think that I could always have a conversation with anyone about removing a statue to a specific political figure. Coming from a soldier's background, um, I think you looking at monuments are two different things. 
a person that is highlighted as a one political figure and a generic war monument. These are two separate things. A political figure, you're elevating that one person. A generic war monument, you're showing uh, um, honor to the people that fought from that area. So coming from my perspective as a soldier of, you know, many would call it an unpopular war in Iraq, that um, what will be the sentiment of statues of my friends in 20 or 40 or 50 years? Will, the, will those statues want to be taken down? Is that to say they should leave them up? I say that they have history to tell. That, Like I just told you, I would have a conversation. I, I would I would be open to having a conversation with removing my own family statue of Senator George. Generic war monuments and statues to one individual are two completely different things. All right. What about Confederate flags? Should they be on state capital and all that kind of stuff? There are there are no state there are no state capitals that hold any Confederate flags anymore. Oh, okay. So that has all that all, has all those have been removed. Mississippi's came down um, two two years ago. So there are currently no state capitals that have any vestiges of any Confederate flags. I got a hard question for you. Let's say you were born in that time frame and somehow you had the attitude you have now. What could have been your position? You would have had no choice to fight for it? Or could you have maybe said, hey, I just cannot live with this? That's a good question. Um, you're talking about would I have defended the institution of slavery versus speaking out about you know, supporting humanity okay basically is okay. that what you're saying okay yes let's go with that um i think that's a difficult question to answer i think I that uh yeah, yeah. i think that's a difficult it, it's difficult to answer because we 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 weren't in the we don't we didn't we didn't live during that time i, I, got I you. think i think that um everybody is influenced by their journey and that's what makes them unique your journey is what makes you unique, the 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 things that you live through. And that's what uh, shaped my outlook over time um, is my personal journey. And I think that's the only reason I'm sitting here. Had I not lived the life that I lived, I don't yeah. think I, would be, I don't think I'd be here talking to you today. Yeah. Um, one instance, when I was in Iraq in 2006, my roommate was from Sierra Leone, West Africa, wasn't even a citizen of the United States. And he was fighting with me, you know day and night supporting and defending our country. And he was just one of the most patriotic people I've ever met. And um, he had a big impact on me. Um, but it was my life specific journey that led me to understand this. I, I, I never wanted something like this. I thought, you know, my mother would have been much better suited for this. She was a very kind, loving person and just a very genuine, just kind hearted person. I thought she would have been great to speak out on this. I think she was too close to the time period connected to the, uh, the fifth, the forties, fifties, sixties during that time period. I think it would have been hard for her to just to make a hard turn from that, you know, her father, not far removed from, you know, that time period. And, um, that's a hard question for me to ask. I, I would hope that I would have have stood for the humanity, but um, the peer pressures and the family pressures of a time like that would have been would have been a difficult thing to overcome, you know. All right. That leads to this question. Do you have those pressures today? Are you worried that somebody might get mad at you? Because because um, yeah, let's, let me leave it at that. As far as my family? No, as far uh, your family, whoever. So I so I notified every, uh, most all my direct family members, even going down to third cousins before I set out on this. And I notified everyone, mother, father, friend, uh, brother, sisters, cousins. And I said that. All of y'all have failed in this. And I'm not blaming you for it, but you had your opportunity to speak up. Moving forward. This is what I'm going to do. And I don't want any disunity towards that. Because 
any of y'all could have been speaking out about this. And I think that it took a very specific person to stand in that reality. And I think that I've gone through things in life that hardened me to that purpose. Um, so I, I, I don't, um, I'm not disappointed in any of my family members that didn't uh, do that beforehand because I understand the implications of standing in that reality, um, being ostracized, threatened, whatever. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. What are the implications? What do you think they could be? Uh, what's the, what's the threat as, to you? To me personally? Yeah, yeah, to you to do oh, I mean, I've, I've, Yeah, I know. I've had, I've had people threaten my life, no, no, no doubt. Oh, really? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You have to understand in this um, division is power. Division is power, both left and right, both black and white. And if you don't, if you think there's a lot of people out there that want to hear this story, they don't. I've had media come up to me do directly and tell me, I will never tell your story. I will never do it. And, you know, wow. to me, I'm, I don't get concerned with that, but I understand where they're coming from because division and racial division has been power in American politics for as long as America has been a country. And that's part of the problem is that America, see, you, you see a lot of people like to uh, pass blame on the Confederacy or the statues or George or the Confederate flag. But the Confederate, Confederacy only lasted four years. What's the United States' excuse? Oh, my God. Huh? There you go. What's their excuse? Because they've used racial politics for 240 years and haven't moved beyond it. So I thought it was important for someone like myself coming from Mississippi to, you know, cons Mississippi's considered the the often the bottom of the barrel, the worst, the most racist. So if I could come here and say... You know, look to my great grandfather sitting down with that governor to try to quell election violence, that if I could come from the perspective that I have in three years and show to people from my perspective, background, heritage of the South, that if I'm able to sit down with families of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake, James Meredith, a descendants of Rosa Parks, Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells. If I can do this, coming from the great grandson of Jim Crow from Mississippi, that nobody has an excuse anymore. That if I can do this, anyone can do this. All right. It was to show a, it was to show a blueprint that unity in the community is possible. That recharging Dr. King's dream is possible, and his words are just as relevant today as they were in the past. All right. At least it is. What do you say to them? In, 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 in one sentence, you, you go up to him, you say, this is who I am. Now, you what you've done today is you've told us the story of what he's done. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people? I'm sorry for that. that that's that's just a, a hint. I don't know. Who, who do I say to what? To, to, to those people you mentioned. What do you say to them? What did you yeah, say no, to I, people I, in I, some? I, I, but first of all, I don't apologize for things that I didn't do. Um, I can be honest with the past and and speak on truth, but I, I, I'm a man that stands in his own uh, faults and, and, and accomplishments, and that's what I stand on. I will gladly hold someone's hand and listen to their grievance and see a lot of these families that I've talked to, especially of police brutality, they have a lot of things to teach because of the pain that they're pouring out into you but as far as me being sorry saying i'm sorry or or one thing or another of course i look back at the the time period with uh with 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 certain disgust because um our people weren't able to move past those grievances and come together um i look back back at that that past and am disgusted because almost six hundred thousand americans had to die towards freeing the slaves where we couldn't have done that peacefully. Um, but I don't, I don't apologize for things that I, I didn't do personally, but I do stand on truth and speak honestly about what happened. And that, and that's, that's the moral of your, your, your effort is to speak honestly about what happened. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I have to, I have to be, I have to be honest with the, with the past to understand the way forward. Dr. King said, I have a dream one day, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. That's why I'm here. I'm here, I'm here to establish that table. And I don't know if Dr. King knew that I was coming. I know, I know he knew I was coming because he talked about it in so many different instances that he knew not just I was coming, but other people like me was coming. And he understood that um, that eventually um, time would heal certain wounds where certain people would present themselves and, and be open and to sp- open to speak up. Um, I'm not going to solve every problem, but what I can show is that we have the ability to sit down and talk about the things that divide us. Um, I'm not going to solve every problem of this country. Um, it's 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 a vast and has a lot of issues, but one thing I can show is that um, I can help to spark an imagination. And if I spark one child's imagination that follows after me, that can solve these problems i've done what i've set out to do and to help to educate the kids coming because this is what this is about if we value the dream we can't just talk about it we have to be willing to live it and pray about it and that's what it's for is for the children moving forward because that's who's going to inherit this when we leave um we have to create a situation where our country is um more united when we leave is is more loving when we leave um i think that is possible but it takes people dedicating to reaching across party and racial lines to have those hard conversations but i do believe that dr king knew um people would come along later down the line that would that would um try to extend that hand and that's part of what i'm doing is to show people from my section from my heritage that if i extend my hand that it will that it will be accepted in peace I and know. i can only i can only do that if i set out to do that and I to know. show them that I it know. wasn't my, my hand wasn't slapped down it was accepted and y'all can do exactly what i've done because if i, I come know. from the worst if i come from the worst there is no excuses i, I can know. do it you can do it. Let's do the hard that. things and come together. I, I got two more questions. Uh, I yes, guess it'd be two more. What was the day, the night when you decided to go on this? If there is, if there's something like that that said you didn't sleep one night or what that you decided this? There absolutely was a day. I I was going through some personal things during that time. And I was going kind of on a, a soul search of my own. And Ahmad Arbery was killed. And um, shortly thereafter, George Floyd was killed. Um, and I went to a christening for a family member's child. And we went back to their house and everybody was partying and, you know, enjoying themselves. And it hit me like that. It hit, it hit me within an instant and I went outside and I sat on the bench and I started calling people and I said, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And this is about a week, five, six days after George Floyd was killed. And I said, in less than three weeks, I'm going to give a speech at the Lorraine Motel where Dr. Martin Luther King was killed. And I called one of my friends and I said, would you support me in this? And he said, absolutely. And I said, well, get ready because I'm about to tell you the truth and we're, we're about to do what we got to do. And shortly thereafter, I reached out to Dr. King's family and I said, would you write me a letter of support to go to the Lorraine Motel to speak about my family, reigniting Dr. King's dream and standing on truth and they said absolutely we would love to and that was the first thing that i ever did i went to the lorraine motel and gave a speech um uh, brought several uh, friends and colleagues and combat veterans and nfl players and community and faith leader leaders to start that journey but to your question yeah it was shortly after george floyd was killed i, I felt that um immediately i knew what i needed to do 
and okay. and him him crying out for his mom um grabbed my heart and and I, if you're a human and you watched that video or heard that i don't see how you, someone wasn't touched by that um and so while while everyone was inside enjoying their snacks i was sitting outside on a bench texting my friends and texting people to try to figure out how I'm going to create this next event, something I have never done before. I had never uh, done a public speaking event. And I thought that if I was going to start one place, it was going to be at the Lorraine Motel. My dad's from Memphis. I try, I went to the National Civil Rights Museum as a child, and 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 I remember seeing some of those uh, those images, and and they they played an impact on me. I remember the old lady out there that's been there for 30, 40 years. I don't know if you know her, but she's been protesting outside there um, since the eighties. I remember her being there. That played an impact on me. I went and saw her when I when I went when I went back there for the event and talked to her. But um, the National Civil Rights Museum played it in played an impact on me as a child and i believe that when dr king was killed there i think that the dream stalled out there and so i believe that it was important for me to begin my journey there to recharge and renew the dream i had to start first and foremost where i felt it stalled out which I was in you. memphis which was in memphis tennessee uh, a couple, couple more H have have other people who got some kind of background like yours uh, white people I'm speaking of have sure. they have they called you and said I'm I'm gonna join your organization I want to uh, I'm gonna be a part of your speakers bureau so mm. that we all go out and share our message to have the same impact I have and uh, you're gonna be quite surprised here shortly all right. Um, all right there was some resistance early on but what I had to show was what was possible. And that wasn't something that was going to happen overnight. Um, it's different standing in my reality in a bulletproof vest, walking through South Minneapolis with a Jim Crow sign, which I did by myself through George Floyd Square. It's different from some uh, relative of Robert E. Lee making a, a comment to the AP about his, his, their family statue coming down in Virginia. It's different when you can make a, a, a statement from the comfort of your home and you ain't 10 toes on the ground like I am. So there's a big difference between, uh, you know, certain people and certain families. And I respect their, those families and, and the, the, the things that they've done, but standing in, in, in a reality, like I told you, where Robert E. Lee had an impact of four years. James George, who invented the, uh, Jim Crow laws, Jim Crow laws had an impact of 70 to 80 years on this country's history. So like I said, the Confederacy lasted four years. We can only blame them for so much. Now America's got a own up to what they've got to own up to and, 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 and be responsible for moving forward. Mm -hmm. But yes, it was important for me to lay a solid foundation to show people from my heritage that this isn't something that's going to be solved overnight, but there is a way forward. There is a blueprint to, sh sh to show that dialogue is extremely important and we have to leave all these channels open. We can't negate um, anyone from this um, conflict resolution process, because if you. we do, we are not going to be successful. We okay. cannot, um, we can't get rid of this person on the other side of the aisle, or we can't get rid of this person because he's a Republican or a Democrat, because we're, we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And Negating somebody from that uh, conflict resolution process will not be uh, beneficial moving forward. We want to include everybody because the table of brotherhood is the table of brotherhood. If I slide somebody's seat out, that ain't no table of brotherhood. If I just right. excluded some, someone from coming to sit at the table that Martin Luther King talk, talked about, you know, to, to um, found it on honesty, reflection, understanding. Yeah. Uh, and reconciliation, how am I going to exclude somebody from that table? So, of course, I want people from uh, my background, my heritage, from those um, historical families to support me and stand next to me. Because, me, yeah, yeah, let me ask ahead. you this. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Have you spoken in front of an all white crowd? I have. I have. Uh, 
did some people walk out or did everybody stay and embrace it? I, I did. I did see one or two people uh, walk out. Um, and the majority of, see, I, I didn't know. I didn't know early on where I was going to get the most resistance from, you know, I, that was one of my curiosities uh, was, was my detractors going to be on the opposing side or on my side? And that was one thing that I was really curious about was where were the most haters going to come from? Right. And it was, it was obviously the white side. Um, The black community has overwhelmingly, I mean, it's, it's, it's so touching. I I can't even explain it because it's just been so overwhelming that it's, it's really touched my heart. The, the African-American community has showed me so much love and so much support that the only reason I am sitting where I am today is because of the support of the, of the African-American community reaching out to me and saying, we love what you're doing. We'd love to sit down with you. We'd love to talk to you. And I was at a stall point at one point in time um, where I didn't know if I'd continue on with this and something really unique happened. Um, Jacob Blake's father reached out to me on Instagram. If you know the story of Jacob Blake, his, his son was shot and paralyzed in Kenosha, Wisconsin, almost killed. And that set off a lot of uh, tumultuous events in that area. Um, but his father reached out to me. On, on on online through social media. And he said, man, I've been watching you. I love what you're doing. I would love to sit down with you and talk about the uh, reconciliation. And I said, absolutely, brother. I flew back up to Minneapolis. We had an amazing dinner, talked about football, family, just a lot of stuff. But uh, we talked about bringing people together. And that was a, that was a unique moment for me where I felt like I wasn't trying to contact other people people were reaching out to me so that was a that was a seminal moment in my journey where i didn't know if that would happen or if i was just it was a it was a a pipe dream just trying to figure things out or just spinning my wheels but that was a organic moment because it wasn't a group trying to bring people together it wasn't a government trying to sit people down it was brothers coming together and and brotherhood and unity organically and trying to solve the problems because government will never solve these problems it has always been up to the people the people have to the people have to figure this out for themselves and then the the government and the country will benefit but the government if they could solve this it would have been solved long ago it is is up to we the people to solve these problems one one more uh are you writing a book and have you written a book and how do people support what you're doing how do they i mean you have a website so that's yeah absolutely absolutely yeah absolutely yeah um i yeah a a book will be in uh coming probably later this year um I, yeah, you can follow me on most uh, social medias at Charles G Sims, Charles G Sims.com, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'll be doing some events upcoming. I'll be in uh, Marks, Mississippi in two weeks, um, supporting an organization there that's doing amazing things for the community. Um, it was important for me to go to Marks, Mississippi. That was where um, Dr. King began his uh mule wagon train from marks for the poor people's campaign to washington dc so uh an individual reached out to me there to support an organization that's doing some amazing stuff so i'll be going to marks mississippi in two weeks but yeah um if you want to connect with me reach out anytime social media is charles g sims and i'll I'll give uh you know updated uh thoughts and uh things that i'm working on 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 those things uh in the upcoming weeks and months one more uh uh, are you an extraordinary guy? I'm not. Uh, I've never considered myself special. Um, I think that I've lived through some uh, special events in life. And that's what I was saying earlier is that what, what my journey is what makes me unique. Right. Your journey is what makes right, you right. unique. Sure, so sure. We're, we're all extraordinary. And our journeys our our own journeys are what make us unique but i lived a very specific life that allowed me to walk this path so like i talked about reaching out to dr king's family i worked with a woman um 15 years ago when i was interning in college at old miss and she knew dr king's family and i haven't spoken to that woman in 15 years 
And it was only that relationship that allowed me to reach back to them to request that letter of support. Yeah, I got you. And I'd never worked with that woman in college. I never probably would have even began this process. So it was, I do believe that, um, certain but no, you picked up the mantle though, man, you didn't have to do it. Yeah. That's the special part. Of it. There are other people who say I can tell jokes. I'm lighting the sure. load now. I'm a, sure. I, and they go around their friends and they make everybody yeah. laugh. But they don't get up on stage. But most people hadn't walked walk down the sh Baghdad in a T-shirt either. And so I think that's what uh, hardened me to my purpose is that I face death in many instances and 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 understand. I understand how valuable life is and how quickly it can go away. Let me and say that, something to you. Mm. You can I'm telling you, you special. Ain't nothing you can do, buddy. I you appreciate can, that. You can you can talk it away however much you want to. And and you should. And be humble about it. I got no problem with that. But that's how I see it. I'm gonna go as far as call you an icon, even at this moment. If you stop today, you. you have iconic ways. Thank you. And really it's too late that. now. You've done something that nobody else has done. So yeah, I got no problem with you being humble as you are, and and stay that way. That go, yeah, hey man, I didn't know, man. This ain't no big thing, man. I I knew I the story. That. I was born that way, but it's more to it than that. And that's what it I'm is, giving it, you. It is, and and I think it was long overdue. And I yeah. think that's one of the things that really motivated me to it. But um. I don't know why it came down to me and not someone else. Like I, I, I don't I, I, know. Dr. King I, didn't either. I don't know. I don't Dr. Know. King, he didn't want to do that movement. Yeah. He was 25 years old. He was pastor of the church. Yeah. Somebody said, hey, you, you're a good orator. PhDs and all that other stuff. We want you to do it. He's like, no, nah, mm -hmm. man, that, that's a death sentence. I'm sure he thought that one night. Mm -hmm. So I had that I'm not conversation wish that on you, but let me say this. Thank you. I I had that you same do. conversation. I, I appreciate I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so yeah, much. But I, I nothing had, you can do about that, man. I had that same conversation with a family member before I went to Minneapolis. They said, Are you prepared to die on this? Yeah. And um I hadn't I, I think up until that point I hadn't really thought about that question. And I know the implications of what I was doing and the people that had came before me that I was doing things that had had gotten people killed and I reached out to um, some armed security to escort me through Minneapolis and I called them and I said, you know, this, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. And they said, you're white, right? And I'm like, yeah, obviously. And I'd like, you know, our two armed security guards to escort me. And they said, absolutely not. We will not go with you under any circumstances to George what? Floyd Square. And I said, I'm trying to hire your business. And they were said, no. And they were like, well, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, since y'all don't want to do your job, I'll go by myself. Wow. So, yeah, I, I, that, that was, that was a pretty unique uh, moment because I just decided that, Hey, I'm going to stand on it. I'm going to let the cards fall where they may. If God wants me where he wants me, he's going to protect me. And I came up on George Floyd square with that Jim Crow sign. And it was intimidating. And all I heard was what the, and it was intimidating. So yeah. I walked over and this lady asked me, she said, sir, what are you doing? And I said, you know, this is the reason I'm here, whatever, whatever. And she said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Mississippi. And she said, baby, I'm from Greenville, Mississippi. And ain't nobody out here going to touch you. So she wow. was, uh, yeah, she, so she was instrumental. They, oh. they called her, they called her gatekeep, gatekeeper. Wow. So she was a, she was a black lady that ran yes. a lot of George Floyd Square, and she took me under her wing and 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 wow. protected protected me while I was there and showed me love and all wow. the people in that area really uh, poured a lot of love into me and 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 I didn't know what to expect walking into that scenario by myself, you know, in a very tense area. I mean, if you remember that stuff I'm back sure, then, I'm sure the riots, sure. everything was boarded up. It was yeah, it was I'm extreme, sure. but. Like I said, if 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 God wants to protect you and put you in the place where you need to be, nothing can touch you. Right. He's going to protect you and guide you and 
But yes, obviously, uh, you know, uh, there's instances where it takes a very special person to stand in a reality that is that is life threatening. And and obviously, yeah, no I'm question. I'm just walking the streets, talking, talking my talk and, and doing what I think is important. I'm not standing in the streets facing water hoses and dogs. You right. understand what I'm saying? Yes. And, and the, the people that came before me went through a whole hell of a lot more. Yes. But I've been so if if all these families that I've talked about suffered and went through a lot of these calamities and hard times and lost family members, walked across these bridges, went through civil rights. I had to do a whole hell of a lot to get here myself. And I'm not That's comparing right. my I'm not comparing right, my right, journey right, 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 to right. their journeys. But imagine what I had to do here to be standing in front of you today. It was not easy. It was painful. It was filled with sacrifice. And um, I lost a lot of people along the way. And it yeah. was it was it was trying and difficult. But like I said, me going and standing across a, a stage or walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge or going to South Minneapolis pales in comparison to Montgomery, Alabama, yeah. to Greenwood, Mississippi, to fire hoses and and, and attack yeah. dogs back then. That's so right. I, That's I, right. I, I look up to the, the the legends of the past and the people that uh, fought for our country. Yeah. Everybody's strong inspirations. Mm, absolutely. Uh, he, I let him, you know, I tried to come up with some good questions. Thank you so very much for coming on the show. Uh, to you, my viewers, um, subscribe. It's free. Uh, hit the, hit the, hit the love button, hit the like button, hit the notifications bell. Tell somebody about strong inspirations. And to you, my brother, I say this and I mean this with all sincerity. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. Stay on it. And and you are special. You can't tell me Thank otherwise. You, you can't Thank convince you. me. You was deemed for this role. I believe because so. of your experiences. That's evident. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. We out. Bye-bye.